K98Talk is expanding its lineup for 2015. This means we are expanding our advertising base. Whether you're a startup trying to push through to the next level or an established business trying to supplement your advertising budget, web-based advertising is a solid investment. Thanks to Talk's newest partnership with TuneIn Radio and instant access to our sister station, K98FM, access at a reasonable cost. Interested parties should email us at sales at k98fm.com. Game on, where progressives fear us and rhinos tremble. Welcome to the political jungle. I'm JD. This is Stacy. No one is safe. No one is spared. Lock up the children. And the old folk. Welcome to the world of liberative conservatarian. That's right, everybody. Welcome to Tuesday night, 10 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, June 23rd, 2015. J and J- JD and Stacy here at Game On on K98 Talk. Packed, jam-packed hour for you tonight. We're going to be talking what's wrong with New Hampshire, more Gruber emails, lies, and fun, the Charleston shooting, the Confederate flag, and the politics of it all, and the latest on the TPA in Congress. As always, everybody, old listeners, new listeners, everybody in between, right now, get over to K98Talk.com, get in that chat room, say hello to Stacy. everybody else who's in there is having fun. Uh, as always, get over to Spreaker.com, hashtag K98Talk. You can find the catalog of everything that Stacy and I do here on K98Talk. What do we do? We do Game On Tuesday nights, 10 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. We do Game On again Thursday nights, 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And every Sunday, 11 a.m., we got uh, Bloody Marys and Broadsheets, which is your cure for that mainstream media hangover, baby. And of course, of course, of course, of course, we want the audience to know you are going on a very special mission this weekend, are you not? Yes, it's a covert mission to Denver. Why don't you tell everybody what you're going to be doing over out at Western Conservatives, but I'm even saying it right. Western Conservatives, my good friends from Alcon Radio, Jody, also known as APL Mom on Twitter, and Di, which is DMB1038, I think. Um, who hosts the Red Wine over there on AltCon, and I will be broadcasting live. I think it's five hours a day, which is a little scary, Um, (laughs) beginning Saturday. And um, I believe we're also on the air sometime on Friday and a little bit on Sunday. So we'll get an exact schedule out soon. Check it out, folks. That's one of Stacey's side projects. She's got her fingers in all sorts of pies all over the place. I will be doing absolutely nothing. So anybody who wants to call, give me a call. Um. <laughs> okay, what are we talking about tonight here? Well, first, New Hampshire. They're insane. What's wrong with New Hampshire? There used to be a saying, I forget if it was Norm Orenstein or who it was, that said, what's the matter with Kansas, which basically had to do with the predilections and the way that they voted. But my question is, what the hell is wrong with New Hampshire? And I have it for a very, very simple reason. There's new polling out in New Hampshire. Jeb Bush is leading the political primary pack for the Republicans, and Donald Trump is a second. Among likely Republican primary voters, former Florida Governor Jeb Bush picked up 14%, while the billionaire real estate mogul Trump grabbed 11 Most respondents, 29% are undecided. I think that's the best news in the poll. No other <laughs> it's candidates, It's got to be the best news of the poll. Jesus. No other candidates, though, are in double digits. Uh, what say you about that? this bernie sanders actually is close well, and, there too on the democrat side right i was gonna say he's closing up the democrat side um earlier this year in april uh hillary clinton was carrying 45 percent of new hampshire miss and uh candidate sanders senator sanders excuse me was carrying 12 uh latest polls show hillary carrying 41 and bernie 31 and hillary 44 and bernie 32 um, they also, just as an aside, on the Republican side in 2012, put Ron Paul at second. So even though they had Romney as first in the 2012 primary, Ron Paul did take second in New Hampshire, um, which kind of gives you a clue as to maybe some of the things they're looking for in that particular state. Um, and oddly enough, <laughs> in 2000, which was a 
2000. Yeah, 2000. They picked Al Gore, but John McCain was number three on the Democrat side due to write in vote. Well, if you want the which history, kind of which is kind of funny given some of the news coming out of the Senate today. So, well, if you want the history <laughs> on Iowa and whether they can be used as a bellwether Vegas lock for picks, if you were a bookie and you would take an Iowa's action, you'd be retired years ago. Going back to '76, the Iowa GOP has hosted seven competitive presidential caucuses: '76, '80, '88, '96, 2000, 08, and '12. They picked the next president once. In 2000, that makes them a whopping one for seven. Even in baseball, which you can play with the numbers and like not hit anything and be a superstar, that sucks. Iowa Republicans are not even particularly adept at selecting the eventual Republican nominee when the race is competitive. They got it wrong in 80. Iowa wanted H.W., not Reagan. Yeah, so Iowa missed Ronald Reagan, okay? This is who we're putting <laughs> They got it wrong well, in 88, I, and they wanted Dole instead of H.W. They got it wrong in 08 and wanted Huckabee. I guess a lot of base fans up there. And they got it wrong again in 2012 when they wanted Santorum. So let's recap this real quick. Iowa has voted for Republican presidential nominee in November exactly once in the last 30 years. That's 2004. And Iowa Republicans have nominated the next president exactly once in the last 30 years in 2000. So why are we letting these corn-subsidized jackasses have all oh this, God, this. Do we have any Iowa people in the room tonight? Oh, go oh. screw. Go screw. Go gets, screw. Let me, I don't we care. lost, I don't we care. lost a listener from? over the whole ethanol thing. So come Good, on. Now. We can lose more. I don't care. Ethanol sucks. <laughs> <your asthma. laughs> but it, to me, it's even more disturbing than that. Um, you know, not only is Iowa wrong on the Republican side a lot more than they're right, they're worth a whopping six electoral votes. New Hampshire is worth four. And they've handed the state to the Democrats. Um, let's see, Iowa, 88 through 2012, with the exception of 2004, so they re-elected Bush. Great. Um, and then New Hampshire has gone Democrat, 92, 96, 2004, 2008, and 2012. Why are we even holding early primaries for the GOP in those states? They can't deliver the state. Well, you brought up to me that Sean Davis back in March had a really good suggested solution to all of this, right? He did, and part of it was simply how strong is the organization within the state and can they deliver the electoral votes? Let's let the early states be the people who can actually deliver in the general. What a concept. I mean, at least we did something right this year and we killed the Iowa straw poll. I mean, that was just a fanatical amount of money spent about nothing. And when you look at the money these candidates pour into New Hampshire and Iowa – and you look at the media coverage of New Hampshire and Iowa, you would think no other state even has a primary. <laughs> I true. mean, it's it's no, crazy. It's true. And for those of you in the audience who haven't read it, it's, uh, it's in the Federalist, Sean Davis, March 18th, 2015. Name of the uh, article is, Sorry, Iowa, you should have to earn the top primary spot from now on. And I thought that, I thought that this actually was just one of the best parts of that article. And this is Sean Davis in The Federalist in March. Republicans are supposed to believe in markets and competition, so there's no reason they shouldn't apply that to their own presidential selection process. Pick a handful of key metrics that will be used, be transparent about the formula and weights used to calculate results, and then let the winners divvy up the choice calendar spots among themselves. Then he mentioned something that I had never really thought about. He said, a state's bubble status, how close was the most recent presidential election, might also be a good factor to consider so you end up with a candidate who can appeal to voters across the political spectrum. The point of a system like this is to align the incentives of the national party and all the state parties. I don't think the GOP will ever go with this because this takes a lot of power out of the centralized party committee, right? Oh, it would take a lot of power out, but also prevent the circus. I mean, when you look at the investments in media and and tourism and the other things that go into these states, not tourism necessarily, but, you know, the tourism industry as a result of being early state primaries, I mean, I can't even name for you at this point who's last. Do they even get covered? I don't even think so. You know, the southern states are trying to put together a block for 2016, so there's a number of them trying to coordinate their vote on the same day. But even that, I mean, you know, in my mind, 
why wouldn't you just have everybody vote the primary on the same day? Go through the whole primary season. Let the candidates go across the country. We're in a digital age. Why do you have to even do this state to state to state to state thing? I don't understand it. Because of the money it brings in. Absolutely. It's all about the money. It's all about the money. But, uh, you know, clearly we're not all intelligent enough to pick up a candidate's position from, you know, their televised coverage, the interviews done with them. I mean, clearly you can't pick up on Hillary's that way because she doesn't answer questions. But, um, you know, for the folks that actually will sit down and do an interview and will participate in a robust debate, you know, what is all what is all the caravanning for? And I think it boils down to exactly what you just said. Money. I mean, that that that's all any of these people really, really are, are concerned about. And, and, and it's how much money that can be brought into the state and how the state can manipulate what candidates and who's jockeying for what position to make sure that the candidate speaks to them. It's it, it, Listen, it's a sickening process. And I'll tell everybody in the audience the truth. I'm in a miserable, foul mood. And, and I honestly, I'll tell you, I, I do not think that there's any hope for it. I'll be completely honest with you. I'll be completely honest with you. Take out your torches and your pitchforks and burn it all to the ground. Starting with New Hampshire because there's something wrong with those people. Jesus, I, I thought I thought Vermont was bad with Ben and Jerry. Well, Vermont is going to vote for Sanders. He's their senator. I mean, come on, we're taking money out of politics, but the guys worth three hundred million dollars are going to be your biggest backers. Huh? How much is he worth? Ben and Jerry's combined oh, net worth oh, oh, is I about three hundred million dollars, and unlike the deodorant companies, which only make twenty-one different kinds of deodorant, they make a hundred and ten different kinds of ice cream. Well, that's or did it. before they sold it. That's how, that's that's how you make all that money. But he's not closing in Vermont; he's closing in New Hampshire, Uncle Bernie. I know because it's right next door to Vermont. Eh, what do they know? There's kind of like this whole live free or die thing in those two states, you know, and even up into Maine. I bet you he's going to do okay up there, too. I'm not talking anymore about New Hampshire. <laughs> okay. It really well, it, it will be interesting. And, um, um, you know, again, this whole primary system might be something if we ever do get a convention of states we might want to specify in the constitution or something because it's ridiculous and for those of you out there who have no idea what that means go google article 5 convention of states and read the whole thing idiots don't don't start trying to talk at, at work like you know what you're talking about it really is it really is as a matter of fact go check out uh if you're on twitter go check out colonel obvious big convention of states guy but enough for new hampshire and enough for the idiots let's talk about more idiots more idiots, more lying idiots. More. Who, who's a lying idiot coming up next in this segment? Um, well, do you want me to count them off alphabetically or numerically? I'll start with Barack Obama. Um, then I'll go to Nancy Pelosi. Then I'll go to any other Democrat who was involved in the Obamacare debate said, I don't know what Jonathan Gruber is. What's a Gruber? <laughs> uh-huh. <laughs> Again, they're caught in an absolute lie through email. Again, it's the email, J.D. Wall Street Journal has the best recap of this. As a matter of fact, this came out this morning. This is from the Wall Street Journal. Jonathan Gruber, the embattled Massachusetts Institute of Technology economist, whose comments about President Barack Obama's health care law touched off a political furor, worked more closely than previous known with White House and top federal officials to shape and influence the law according to previously unreleased emails. The emails provided by the House Oversight Committee to the Wall Street Journal cover messages Mr. Gruber sent from January 09 to March 2010. This is great. This is great. I, the one thing I cannot explain to anybody on the show, I do not understand it. But for some reason, for some reason, I don't understand how the administration can put people in the position where their own Department of Justice, where their own Department of Justice refuses to prosecute people who lie or obstruct or commit perjury to Congress. But the information eventually comes out through FOIA requests. I, I don't. Anybody in the, in the audience who's worked with Congress before, <laughs> please just email. I, I don't understand this. But here's, here's some of the top it, hits. I'm sorry. Go ahead. I was going to say, it's usually Judicial Watch. <laughs> I mean, the number of FOIA requests that they've denied is immense, but the amount of garbage that's come out on some of these scandals as a result of them is just insane, and it gets very little coverage. I was surprised at how much this one actually did, but it probably goes back to what happened earlier this year. Well, it more has to do with who's covering. So, so here's some of mm-hmm. the hits. 
Here's some of the hits from the guy that nobody heard about. And what, what are you kidding me? And we didn't work with him. He's got nothing to do with the health care law. Meanwhile, he's on a national tour telling everybody how smart he is and how stupid the American voter is and how he is the architect of Obamacare. So here's what's come out since the administration, Nancy Pelosi, and everybody else went, I, 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 I have no idea who this ass is. February 09, from Ezekiel Emanuel. If you don't know who he is, he's Rahm Emanuel's brother, and I'll say it, he's one of the most detestable human beings on the planet. Special advisor of health policy at the Office of Management and Budget, OMB. Ezekiel Emanuel to Gruber, quote, P.S., I understand from John Blum there's going to be a contract with you that will allow us to work with you in the email. Emanuel puts, quote, guilt-free, unquote. April 15th, 2009, from Gruber to Nancy Ann DePaul. She was then the White House Health Reform Director. She's the one who had a fall on a sword, I think, uh, over the website. Um, This is Gruber. Quote, but I was wondering if there was any ways to educate POTUS more on why the tax exclusion is a good source of funding if done wisely. All right. So here's the guy talking to his the head of the White House Health Reform, the director, asking what she thinks he can do to educate moron. All right. May. From Gruber to a congressional committee staffer and Gene Lambrew, a top Obama administration health advisor who worked in the HHS in the White House and other recipients. Quote, I defined a loser as someone who was a non-group insurance beforehand is now forced into a reform non-group market, parentheses example, I assume no grandfathering, and pays more in that aftermarket than accounting for subsidy eligibility. Yes, if your eyes are rolling back in your head, so am I. So all of a sudden, the guy who nobody knows, the guy who hasn't touched Obamacare, the guy who is just somebody who's telling stories at conventions and frat parties, they get his winky waxed by people who think that that would be interesting, now has an email chain with people asking what he can do to educate the president of the United States. (laughs) But they never heard of him, J.D., and then, and then, did you hear Josh Ernest's response in the White House presser earlier this week? No. He was, he was bemused by the new information on Gruber. Bewitched so basically, this guy goes on a nationwide speaking tour talking about how stupid the American voter is. And of course the exchanges were set up to force, or the subsidies were set up to force the states to create their own exchanges. That was by design. But no, he had no authorization to speak like that because he wasn't involved in anything. Then we get documented proof that people within the administration were asking him to educate the president and the White House press secretary is bemused. Of course. What, what, what there's else? no response. There's no rebuttal. There's no nothing. There is just, ah, eh, whatever. Well, here, here's another one. Here's one of the last in the chain. January 14, 2010, from Jason Furman, ep- economic advisor to President Obama, to Gruber. Quote, we got to deal with labor. Keep that very close held. We'll share the details with you tomorrow or today, technically, not what you would have designed as a czar, but this is now going to happen. He was a czar. <laughs> Tell you what, if you've ever heard this guy talk, he more strikes me we as a We have czar-ina. czars of everything now. He's more of a czarina. <laughs> I know, but that was that was definitely a term coined at some point in an administration in my childhood. I think the first one I ever heard was a drug czar. Always thought the application of that term was weird, but it's the head guy in charge of that. So somebody called him that, but he had nothing to do with the health bill. Czar is just code for more advisors that do not have to be confirmed and go through the vetting process of Congress. <laughs> and that, that's exactly. why you see this administration. Didn't we have an Ebola, Ebola czar? Why? They have Ebola? <laughs> No, no, but when the Ebola when the Ebola virus came to the United States, we had to have an Ebola czar. Well, because probably whoever they had in mind would have never got through Congress. That's all the the, the whole czar thing is. No, he had no qualifications whatsoever. But I always thought Ebola czar sounded like a character in a Universal He Man movie or something. I don't know. It just sounded ridiculous. Wasn't that but... Housecracker's name at one point on Twitter? Huh. Wasn't that Housecracker's name at one point on Twitter, Obolazar? Obolazar or something like that. Yeah, I think it was. (laughs) The stupidity never stopped. I mean, we're just so screwed. New Hampshire's got a bunch of morons over there that are getting polled. We got 
a media that just rolls over and says Gruber never existed, but a FOIA request in the Wall Street Journal showing that this guy was knee deep with his fingers deep inside of Obamacare. I don't hear the how disgusting that picture is painted in your head. We're coming back on the other side with the Charleston shooting, Confederate flag, and the politics of it all. Stay tuned here on K98 Talk with JD and Stacy on Game On. <laughs> The staff of K98 Talk and the Spark Radio Network is proud to announce that our very own Rowdy Rick Robinson has been selected as one of the top conservative talk show hosts in the nation for his program, America Off the Rail. Again, congratulations to Rowdy Rick Robinson for a job well done and another reason to stay connected to K98 Talk and the Spark Radio Network. If you like your health care plan, you'll be able to keep your health care plan. This is the most transparent administration in history. Not even a smidgen of corruption. Fact is, we had four dead Americans. What difference at this point does it make? If you've got a business, you didn't build that. The feeling most people get when they hear a Barack Obama speech, my, I felt this thrill going up my leg. I well, mean, I don't have that too often. Steady. It's time to hear the truth about America's biggest challenges. Ricky Robinson, host of America Off the Rails, will tackle the important issues facing America today as he tries to keep America from coming off the track. Get ready to hear the truth every Monday through Friday starting at 7 p.m. Eastern, 6 Central, here on K98talk.com and the Spark Radio Network. Red Nation Rising brings you Town Hall Radio. From a single tweet to three million a month, our community is a force to be reckoned with on social media. So don't miss our show Thursdays, 8 p.m. Eastern on K98 Talk. Our chat room is our co-host and you ask the question. Join us and be heard. So get ready to sound off on Red Nation Rising Radio. No one else is going to do it for you. K98talk.com, a leader in internet radio. So grab your seatbelts and take the ride of your life on K98talk.com. J.D. and Stacey here on K98 Talk, taking you into the bottom half of the 10 o'clock hour. About to start talking the Charleston shooting, the Confederate flag, the politics of it all, and all that happy stuff. Everybody right now, get over to K98Talk.com, get in the chat room, say hi to Stacey. We want to thank Ricky Robinson and the Spark Radio Network and K98 Talk for having us on. You can find us, as always, Tuesday nights, 10 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Thursday nights, 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. 11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time for that Bloody Marys and Broadsheets, baby. Your mainstream cure for that hangover, 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 hangover. All right, all right, all right. What a mess, huh? I don't even know where to start. Well, go ahead. <laughs> I mean, okay, so clearly we know what happened in Charleston with Dylan Roof, Amy Church, horrible, horrible tragedy. The governor of South Carolina, the people of South Carolina came together, grieved together. Governor Haley makes what is, and we've heard it twice now, a heartfelt, touching speech regarding what's happened to her state. She gets panned by the media. And then who shows up? My favorite, DeRay McKesson. For those in the and all the media for those and audience, everybody waiting wait, wait, for a circus. Wait, for those in the audience who don't know, why don't you tell them who D. Ray McKesson is? D. 
D. Ray McKesson is the former uh, director of human capital for the Minneapolis Public School District, and I cannot verify this, but I'm pretty sure he was recruited by some Soros organization to start spearheading political activism related to Black Lives Matter, starting with Ferguson. He was in Ferguson all the time after the Brown shooting, and he has traveled to the site of every single um, potentially racially divisive situation since then, including a pool party in McKinney, Texas. So he's a bomb thrower. He's a bomb thrower like nobody I've ever seen. And the thing I liked best about DeRay's visit to Charleston in particular, Charleston had a unity march. They expected 2,500 people, 10,000 people showed up, all colors, all ages. It didn't matter. They held hands and they marched across their bri- that bridge. Guess who sat out? Let me guess, the president and the administration. Um, Not only them, but D. Ray McKesson, because it was too intense. He really said that? Really? Yeah, on his Twitter feed. He's a moron. It was it was pretty pretty intense down there. It was the most peaceful, loving thing I have seen broadcast in a long time. Intense doesn't even describe it except emotionally intense for a city in mourning, right? And he has to sit out because it's too intense. He sat out because it was unifying. There was nothing that he could do to stir it up and turn it into a circus. But this is a political show. So we're going to have to talk about the politics of this. I don't care how crass or base or, or however you see it because they're already starting to be played out here. Hillary Clinton took a, took a stand on the dead today um, talking about institutional racism. But let's talk about this Obama dropped the N-word on a radio show. This close to treasonous scumbag that we have sitting in the White House. I have never said that before. I have never, well, I've never said that live on the air before. But I'm at the point where he is. Because you can't talk about race in this country without being shut down and having a bomb throw at you for being a racist or being this or being that or what have you. The President of the United States went on a podcast podcast because he really has respect for the office and on this podcast he spoke about how we as a nation and this includes everybody in the office because he was talking in in the audience because this this includes the american people that institutionally in our dna we are a racist society at heart hillary clinton picked it up and ran with it the left is picking up and running with it and the media loves this narrative the president of the united states all 330 million of you and the 20 to 50 illegals that are here okay He's president of all of us. Love him, hate him, don't like him, trust him, I don't care. He goes on a podcast and he says that this country has institutional racism in their DNA. And the media loves it and they run with it and now we're a racist country and, you know, Republicans are running around taking down flags and, you know, we have to, we have to understand it. Oh my God. Da, da, da. Let me tell you something. Anybody who walks into it, you've all seen this. It's played out, unfortunately, over the last 30, 40 years. People who generally do things like this, they get referred to as a loner or isolated or inward or whatever you want to call it. They have gone through some of this kid's stuff and what he was doing online. Think about this for a second. ISIS can connect with people all over the world, including here in this country, and radicalize them online and get them to a point where they want to blow up things in the United States or travel overseas to fight in some stupid jihad with a bunch of people wearing sweatpants, tuxedo shoes, and carrying AK-47s, okay? This is all possible because of technology. You can reach anybody on the planet instantly. Dylan Roof was so isolated because he couldn't find anybody to buy into this racial massacre that he wanted to commit. Was he a racist? Hell yeah, he's a racist. Should they kill him in prison? Damn straight they should. And they should hang him by his ankles and bleed him slow. But this, damn it, is not a racist country. And I am going to say something right now that I am going to get vilified for. But if you do not think that there are racist black people who don't like white people the same damn way that there are white people who don't like black people, there are. And in this country right now, on both sides, they're outliers. 330 million people in this country after a revolution fought in a constitutional convention in 1787. Everything that we've weathered, civil rights, marching in the streets, George Wallace... Dogs getting sicked on people, getting shot, lynchings, the civil rights workers murdered, the FBI getting involved. And this guy is going to sit here as the head of the greatest nation that God has ever seen and tell us that we're racist? I'm not buying it. Well, and be patently absent. What? And be patently absent. A country is in shock. A community is wounded. 
a state is struggling, our president gets on TV to say, damn those guns, and flies off to California for a fundraiser or four. Can't be late to Tyler Perry's house. Well, hold on a second. I'm sorry, J.D. J.D., when when 9-11 struck, what did George W. Bush do against the advice of his Secret Service? He marched across the lawn and he spoke to the American people. Okay? Because- Presidents and leaders do not disappear during crisis and they do not politicize it three minutes out of the gate. Because he's not a leader and he doesn't care. Hey, look. It used to be if you said these things about the president, you were some kind of nut and this, that, and the other thing. I, I, I'm a firm believer. I say this all the time to you off the air. I don't care what people tell you, how much they tell you they love you, they care for you, this, that, and the other thing. People should be judged on their actions, not their words, not what they tell you. Not that I got your back or I love you or this, that, whatever people tell you, and, and yeah, 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 yeah. People always say all kinds of stuff. At the end of the day, you judge people on their actions. Some And look, we got 30 minutes left in this show. Somebody, anywhere, point out a concrete action to show me that this guy, and that's right, I'm not saying the president or the president of the United States or Mr. Obama, that this guy, this Chicago pal, this just, I mean, inch away from being some kind of treasonous criminal, you show me where he has done anything in the best interest of what used to be the United States. Where? Where We don't even have in this segment that we're probably going to say for Thursday w- the fact that, that w- what he's doing with, with, with the hostage negotiation po- policy. Oh, my God. Don't even get me started. And I've been saying this, 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 and nobody listens to it. This is the Alinsky playbook to the T. These people were not cowed in 14 because of the Republican election. You know who was cowed? Mitch, ba- Mitch Boehner. John Boehner and Mitch McConnell and the rest of the idiots in Washington on our side. You know what the Democrats see? Tick, 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 tick. Everybody put their foot on the gas so they can crash Obama's truck through the left side of the wall so that they can install Hillary in the new hunter they have down in D.C. Well, I mean, this country has become so divided, so polarized right and left, black and white, male, female, gay, trans. I mean, my God, if you don't fit into some nice little box and monitor your speech and say exactly what you're supposed to say, your own side will start to chew on you. Uh, You and I have seen it happen to ourselves being relative conservatarians, and there's certain things that we don't line up with, you know, completely with the evangelical right. We get destroyed for it on social media. We get attacked by our own side. And those divisions... Another four years of Hillary Clinton are only going to get deeper. It's going to be eight. It's going to be eight. It's going to be eight until somebody in this field wakes up and realizes how to politic and how to talk and not get scared about issues that the left is just pummeling them with. Then it's going to be eight. It's going to be eight. Everybody in this radio audience is staring at a straight 16 years of progressive policies. If she's elected in 16, it's going to be eight of Obama and eight of her. Or maybe eight of Obama and three of her because the damn world will blow up after that. Well, that's, you know, actually, I don't think it'll take Iran that long to make a weapon. But see, this this, this goes back to, to and now, right before we came on the show, I, 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 thought, I saw it was breaking. Maybe this came out before. The There's going to be more negotiations on this Iran deal that, that's already done. So what I'm getting sick of, and one of the things that Stacey and I try to deliver to the audience is I'm tired of all the obfuscation and the smoke and mirrors and people taking sound bites and this, that, and the other thing. Governor Nikki Haley and a bunch of other prominent Republicans have seized this moment. Look, the left isn't the only one who stands on dead bodies. The Republicans are, do it as well. And they're doing it with this right now with the push to take down the Confederate flag. The politics of it actually are smart for the field. Because it now takes in a primary, it removes everybody from having to defend the Confederate flag. But here's the whole point of this. The whole point of this is now we're speaking to the audience of, oh, hey, our guys can't defend the repack. Well, why can't they? You know, but why? Because the media is going to say that they're racist. Why? Well, you talk to talk to a Democrat because the Confederate flag is what the, the, the Confederacy. That was the symbol of the Confederacy. And, and, and the way marked it. Listen, it's complicated. 
And yes, it's very complicated. Exactly. And people look at the Confederate flag and they they say, oh, look, that was the the Confederacy. Yes, no, and maybe. This is the history of what people refer to as the Confederate flag. It was actually a battle flag, and it was the battle flag of the Army of Northern Virginia. It was used in battle beginning in December 1861 until the fall of the Confederacy. The blue color on the satire in the flag was navy blue, as opposed to the much lighter blue of the Confederates' navy jack. The flag stars, everybody knows the design, the orange with the, with the blue X and the stars. The flag stars represented a number of states in the Confederacy. The distance between the stars decreased as the number of states increased, reaching 13 when, the, when Kentucky and Missouri joined in 61. Now, because of the Can I just the... say used by Bill Clinton in his campaign in 1992 mm-hmm. as a symbol and also flown over the Arkansas State House to recognize their Confederate history also by Bill Clinton. But let's not go there. Well, this, here's, here, here's a little interesting fun fact. In addition to all of this, Confederate regiments during the Civil War carried many other flags. And this added to the possibility of a lot of confusion on the battlefield. General P.G.T. Beauregard wrote that he was, quote, resolved then to have our flag changed if possible or to adopt for my command a battle flag, which is what the Confederate flag was of the Army of North Virginia, which could be entirely different from any state or federal flag. He turned to his aide, who happened to be William Porcher Miles, the former chairman of the Confederate Congress Committee on the Flag and Seal. And Miles had pitched this idea about a national flag that had been rejected. Now, during the Confederacy, there were three iterations of what was called the Confederate national flag. What is referred to as the Confederate flag appears on what's called the second national flag. It was called the Stainless Banner. It ran from 1863 to 1865. During the solicitation for second Confederate national flag, there were many different types of designs that were proposed, nearly all making use of the Northern Army of Northern Virginia battle flag which by 1863 had become well-known and popular among those living in the Confederacy. The new design was specified by the Confederate Congress to be a white field, with the Union now used as the battle flag to be a square of two-thirds. So basically, it was what is referred to as the Confederate flag in the left-hand corner of a plain white flag. It was designed by, here it is, William T. Thompson. He was a newspaper editor and writer based in Savannah, Georgia. Now, am I defending the Confederate flag? No, because this quote is attributed to the designer of what was called the Second National Flag. Quote, the white man's flag. In referring to the white field that compromised a large part of the flag's elements, Thompson stated that its color symbolized the, quote, supremacy of the white man, unquote. The Second National Flag ran from March, May 1st, 1863 to March 4th, 1865. Why was there no really other flags after that? Because they lost the war. Well, and the flag that everybody objects to is the one that they call, you know, Dixie with the blue X with the stars and the, and the red. Mm-hmm. But specifically in South Carolina, this didn't hang over the state house. That had been resolved 15 years ago. This hung over a Confederate War Memorial. Aside our own flag of the country, there was also a Confederate flag. The governor of the state, and I truly believe she did this to avoid DeRay and the Black Panthers, who have all showed up in town. They're just waiting for something to happen. You know, I've heard from disaster relief folks that the media has been there nonstop since this happened waiting for something to happen. I think Governor Haley and her staff are doing an excellent job of trying to keep everything calm and controlled and unified. She gets up and gives a speech where she articulates that she, by the way, is a twice-elected female minority governor. Tim Scott, one of two black senators who got more, and and Tim Scott actually got more votes than Lindsey Graham, which, you know, kind of makes me giggle because I like Tim Scott better. Um, It's been voted in national polls the friendliest state and the most patriotic state in the country recently. And they're getting hammered. Not only this, but not that long ago, they they weathered the shooting of Walter Scott and became a proactive state legislature by passing the first body cam law in the country. They're doing everything they can to address issues as they come up because they know their history and they know they're going to be judged more harshly, and they have been. 
I am not defending what was fought for, defended, and was represented by the Confederacy. But before we mm-hmm. go to commercial break, there's a moment in time that I will never forget. I can't remember what I had for breakfast, but there's a moment in time I, c- I will never forget. It was the late 1990s, and J.D.'s working on the trading desk. Yeah, down in that Manhattan, baby, on that Wall Street. And, you know, you have just so many different screens opened up. And this was before 9-11, and the first time I had ever heard of what was referred to as the Taliban, and they were fighting the Northern Alliance, and they were in Afghanistan. And one of the things that caught my eye is because as human beings, we are very visual people. It was a video, and don't forget, this is the late 90s, so there wasn't that much video out there on the web, and it was the video or a picture of what they had called the Taliban. We'd all, all come to know who they were very well in a few years, but we didn't at the time. What that picture was was of them blowing up some Buddhist monuments and statues that had been there for centuries and centuries and centuries. And I'm not saying it's the Taliban, and I'm not defending the Confederacy, but they're literally talking about taking and removing it from pictures and taking the flag out of different monuments and things like that. They Maybe took it off. They took it off eBay, out of Walmart, off Amazon. Oh, but betcha, you know what you can find on Amazon? You can find an ISIS flag. You can find Che Guevara, too, and a bunch of Nazi memorabilia. This is so ridiculous, it's not even funny. They are actually trying to erase history. J.D. completely forgot that point he was making, so we're going to end it there. Coming back on the other Um, side, tying it up with some TPA. Hey everybody, this is Jason, host of According to Me. I'd like to invite you to check out my show. It's a two-hour show that lasts 60 minutes in... Uh, listen, I hate to interrupt, but uh, one thing I can do is read off a script. Just say, uh, let me be clear a lot. It works. President Obama, I, I, I can handle this. It's a radio promo. I, I'm not green. I've done this before. Did someone say green? Now Al Gore is here. Listen, I'm just trying to record a radio promo. Do you mind? Now, uh, do you say good things about me on the show? <laughs> no, not at all. But if it makes you feel any better, I rip on Republicans just as much. The AM radio frequencies give off very high levels of radiation. Look, my show is on the internet, which you invented. I mean, can, I, can I just do my promo? I got a pen. I can veto that, you know. I know you got a pen. It's not a law. It's a radio promo. Listen, listen, just listen to my show. Barack Obama and Al Gore hate it, so you're going to love it. Here's an executive order. Don't listen to a show. He doesn't like me. He's racist. And he doesn't recycle either. That's it. I'm done. It's According to Me, Wednesdays, 10 p.m. Eastern, right here on K98 Talk. Wondering why you're up early with us on a Sunday morning making a cocktail? News lately got you drinking? Hung over from the mainstream media by Sunday? We are, and we got you covered. We sure do. We got your hangover cure for those weekly news blues. So sit back, top off your mimosa, and add some Baileys to that coffee. Take a match to your copy of the New York Times. Light, funny, and oh yeah, news with booze. And a lot of laughter. Welcome to Bloody Marys and Broadsheets. If it's Sunday, it's Bloody Marys and Broadsheets. We're your cure from your weekly news hangover. We will never fully understand what we've asked of our military service members or their families, asking them to put themselves in harm's way, to endure it all. But we do understand that it's our turn, our duty, to keep them secure for the rest of their lives. Wounded Warrior Project long-term support programs help our most severely ill or injured veterans live independently, at no cost, for life, so that they might stand at ease. Join us at findwwp.org. K98 Talk is expanding its lineup for 2015. This means we are expanding our advertising base. Whether you're a startup trying to push through to the next level or an established business trying to supplement your advertising budget. Web-based advertising is a solid investment. Thanks to Talk's newest partnership with TuneIn Radio and instant access to our sister station, K98FM, we give you worldwide access at a reasonable cost. Interested parties should email us at sales at k98fm.com.
Welcome back, everybody, to K98 Talk with J.D. and Stacy here on Tuesday night for Game On. Everybody right now, get over to K98talk.com. Get in that chat room. Say hi to Stacy. Talk to everybody else in there. I'm sure they're having some good policy discussions going off the rails about something. And join us again, of course, Thursday night, 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, where I believe Stacy's going to be live from us from Western States. And we want to thank, 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 thank our lead in here every Thursday night, 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Remember, Thursday night's a two-hour block of radio, kids. You got Radio Red Nation rising. With that Lou and that Jared, baby, there at 8 p.m. Eastern Standard on K98 Talk. And got Stacey and I again for Game On after that. And Sunday morning, 11 a.m., Bloody Marys and Broadsheets. Get over to Spreaker. Check us out. And that's all I got to say. All right. Well, before we close out the last topic, unless there's something you would like to add, um, I just want to say give a call out to two people that I really like and respect. Uh, one of them is Caleb Howe. actually wrote an excellent article on Red States uh, regarding the Confederate flag flag and having it flying on uh, government property and really from a southerner's point of view and I I respect his opinion and, and thought he stated it very well and there was another article today by Red Steez, Stephen Miller on the wilderness.com um, I would I would strongly suggest checking both of their TLs for those articles because they were both very thoughtful and um, really made me stop and think about my own perspective on on the situation. All right, third segment to close out the show, we're going to be talking about what went on in Congress today and what's been going on in Congress the past couple of weeks with TPA. I would be doing the audience a great disservice if I tried to explain this. Stacy, uh, along with Stephanie Scruggs over at Coalition for a Strong America, and a lot, a lot of fine patriots have been living, eating, and breathing this fight. So why don't you tell everybody exactly where we are and what's going on? Well, this morning we did what was called a vote for cloture in the Senate. And what cloture means, if you don't know, is that we're going to stop debating this bill. The only bright spot this morning was Senator Cruz had an epiphany overnight because somebody actually gave him the documents from a trade agreement currently under negotiation called TISA, Trade and Services Agreement. Um, As is typical of this administration (laughs) and some of our GOP leadership, uh, they told people like Senator Cruz that there was no way any of these trade agreements would impact our immigration laws within the United States. The documents from 2014 that WikiLeaks has gotten a hold of clearly state that that's not the case at all. There are over 50 professions that would have open visa requirements. Um, the licensing requirements for things like teachers and doctors and and engineers and other professionals that require some kind of certification or license to practice could be eliminated. And right now that's in the control of the states. So this isn't just going to affect federal law. It's also going to affect state law if it passes. Biggest problem with TPA, and again, TPA, Trade Promotion Authority, puts the ball in Obama's court to negotiate these deals. They do have to be ratified by Congress, but if TPA passes tomorrow, they will only have to be ratified by a majority vote. Treaties are supposed to be two-thirds for a reason. Uh, Tomorrow's vote on Trade Promotion Authority itself, it's already been passed in the House. If it's passed in the Senate tomorrow, we'll go to Obama's desk for his signature. Uh, Your erstwhile GOP leadership, along with uh, Representative Ryan, have given away the farm on this one, kids. Because to get TPA passed, they are also going to pass TAA, which uh, to fund it, they originally tried to do it with Medicare Medicare dollars. That didn't fly with the Dems, so now it's a additional tax on small businesses. So your GOP leadership is going to pass the bill that taxes small businesses and also reauthorize the XIM Bank um, to get trade promotion authority for Barack Obama so he can implement a progressive global agenda. I feel like I want to live on a different planet. You know, Cher said earlier this week if if uh, Donald Trump got elected, she'd move to Jupiter. Um, if we get TPP or, God forbid, TISA, which is the equivalent of a European Union-style agreement, um, I'm thinking if she's on Jupiter, I'll go to Mars because I can't live with Cher. Yeah, they, they're taking they're taking uh, applicants for that one way trip for the uh, for the colony to Mars. I don't know about Jupiter, um, but go. Th- <laughs> you basically have this passing by a majority because of the mechanics and machinations that have been done in the House and Senate over the past week, week and a half, right? 
Correct. And and the cloture vote today did need 60. They did get 60. Uh, we missed it by one, kids. <laughs> and um, we tried really, really hard. And I want to thank all of the folks over at Red Nation Rising, the folks who run the main account, the state accounts, uh, Linda behind PJ Strike Force, as well as um, some other folks on social media. They have been tireless in their efforts to try to influence our senators with getting people to call. And again, folks, people felt harassed. And I think one of the things we have never done on the right very well is unify and actually tap into our government and make noise. And I think if we don't get better at that going forward, um, we're not going to be able to affect that change. And let me tell you, through this whole process, they really didn't like it. And I think we may need to make them not like life a lot more often than we do. I know the activist community on our side is all ginned up about this. And, I, and I'm with you on not ceding any more power to the executive. But everybody has to take a breath and take a step back. I, I'm not saying that this is good policy. But things of this, this is... This has become an issue because of Obama's relationships. This has become an issue because nobody trusts this guy because of his pen and his phone. I want you to envision a scenario. And yes, TPA should not be granted to this president under this administration. There's just too much that they could do with it. But correct me if I'm wrong. The history of this for the past 50 or 100 years has been that this has been a pretty much a formality and perfunctory power to give to an executive. My only concern, and I think it's why it's some of the people that we were very surprised that seem to be hemming and whoring on this, whoever is going to be the nominee, if they get elected, because they're going to fight against TPA, is going to have a hell of a time when it's their turn to have to negotiate trade to explain why they should be given some latitude and executive authority. I'm more playing devil's advocate, but this could come back to bite our own side in the ass, no? It could to some degree, but my position is more this. I think there were some very simple things that, that could have made a lot of the pressure on the GOP go away. If you had passed the Cruz Sessions Amendment, regarding immigration to say that we will not enter into any treaty that nullifies or changes U.S. immigration law, or if you had maintained the vote at a two-thirds majority. Fast track initially, in my understanding of the history, literally means you don't get to amend it and there's limited debate because you can't bargain an international agreement and then go back to the table with every amendment that Congress wants. You well, have to, to look me, at the entire package. That to me is what they call in business and in mergers and acquisitions a poison pill. Because unless, unless I miss, in a vacuum, excluding Obama and everybody else, isn't this, at least the stated purpose of it, is to give a president some latitude in the beginning opening rounds with the expectation of whatever that's negotiated goes back to Congress, right? Absolutely, and it will go back to Congress, but with a simple well, majority Congress, thumbs up yeah. or thumbs down instead of a two-thirds majority is required by the Constitution regarding international treaties. What's the difference between this Congress and the one that was run by Nana and, uh, and, and Dingy Harry? Why, we have a Republican majority, but you'd never know it. Well, that's my whole point. That, that's my whole point. It, it's almost like this, and I mean, this goes back to what I said about 45 minutes ago. I'm, I'm at the point today of blow it all up. I'm at the point today of blow it all up because the same people who are trying to take the power away from the executive to put it back in their own pocket are the same institution and people who at every turn try to cede more of their power and go on vacation or work three or four days a week. Well, and it's not just that, but rather than trying to understand what the conservative wing of the party is looking for or what might make – rather than negotiating with the right or more conservative-leaning wing of their own party – they're booting them off committees, taking spokesperson jobs away from them. And you have to believe some of that is translating over to the Senate. You know, who didn't show up for the vote today? And I don't know why, so I'm not going to say I know why. Was it Cruz? Mike Lee. Oh, Mike Lee. What is Mike Lee's position? I believe he's the attorney for the Senate majority. Well, he has was... a position on McConnell's staff. It surprised people when McConnell appointed him. He voted no on TPA in the first pass. Take a look next door at what's going on in the House. They're shooting people right and left, and the only things we know of 
are the people who've been relieved of their positions. There's a whole group of conservatives over in the House right now that are about to revolt and start talking about the other crap they've been putting up with. I've that was in he- the examiner. I've been hearing about the conservative revolt coming for a long time, and they get us all excited, all excited. Genesep, Genesep, teases, 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 and roll over. But, I mean, it's not, it's not the Mark Meadows that are rolling over. It's not the three people that didn't vote the way they were supposed to vote on the House rule that are rolling over. It's Boehner and McConnell and Scalise and Ryan and the people who are spearheading this and making them behind the doors deals to begin with. You don't see you don't see Rand Paul rolling over. Jeff Sessions has not moved on this thing. I don't trust a one of them. But the one thing we can't do in an hour on Tuesday night is save the world. We can just tell it what's going on and why they got to fight. Ain't that right? Absolutely. <laughs> I'm tired, J.D. It's been a long week and a half. You don't got to tell me that. All right, folks, we're going to see you again Thursday night at 9 p.m., but Thursday night at 9 p.m., Stacy's going to be broadcasting live from the Mobile West Coast Command out in Denver. Why don't you tell everybody about your fun trip coming up? Absolutely. I'll be at Western Conservatives out in Denver with my good friends from AltCon, Jody and Di from the Red Wine. Looking very forward to it and broadcasting live from Thursday night. And I'll be sitting here trying to put my marbles back together, get them in my head, and figure out why I was put on this planet. Either way, folks, I'll see you Thursday night at 9 o'clock. I'm looking for you, you Occupy freaks, with your glitter bombs. Bring it on! Bring on the glitter. Everything has changed. Everything has changed in the last few years. Conservatives used to take it, and we're not taking it anymore.